Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. We want to give you a very special welcome as you come and join us together for this uh, Guild uh, Dedication Service. And it's nice to see the Guild members here uh, nicely seated at the front. So we are looking forward to uh, celebrate today as we dedicate um, you as, as a group uh, within uh, our church. So uh, we pray that you will have a, a, a meaningful uh, service with us uh, for those who are here and for those who will be joining us later on uh, on, on the internet, uh, on YouTube and online. So welcome to everyone here today. Now the Church of Scotland Guild is a movement uh, within the Church of Scotland uh, which invites and encourages uh, both men and women to commit their lives to Jesus Christ and enable them to express their faith uh, in worship, uh, prayer and action. And with that in mind, we, we are going to hear a report. We are going to have members of the Guild to take part in this service, uh, both in reading and in prayers as well. So um, we are very much with you and looking forward uh, to that. Just a few words from Psalm 134 as our call to worship this morning. Praise the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. And may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven. And, earth. and so our opening hymn is 124, Praise to the Lord. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, 
We give you thanks for bringing us here today together in this place we love and know so well. Help us to shut out all the worries of the past months and go forward in faith with you. Forgive us that we may have lost sight of you at times during the pandemic, even though we knew deep inside that you were still there, guarding and guiding us. Heavenly Father, when we come to you, it is like walking out of darkness into light. We come to you today with your peace surrounding us, and we thank you for your mercy and grace to us all. Heavenly Father, we come to you today as members of the Church of Scotland Guild, and together with this congregation, we praise you with thanksgiving in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come seeking your truth. We come to allow the light of your love to drive out any darkness in our lives. Let our love for you shine out to others, so that they too may know the light of your love as we look forward in faith. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we pray together in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of heaven. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you here. And on behalf of the Guild, it is lovely to be here and be together again. It has been a long time and we have missed our friendship and fellowship. We are looking this morning at reflecting on the extra mile and going the extra mile. So let's think of a few questions for the Guild. Benjamin has already explained what the Guild is about. The Guild's motto says, whose we are and whom we serve. And it's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 23. Serving is one of the main areas within our guild. So I wonder, when did the guild start? The Church of Scotland Women's Guild started, believe it or not, in 1887. It was founded by the Reverend Archibald Charteris, who recognised the contribution being made by the ladies of the church at that time. In 1997, the Church of Scotland's Women's Guild became the Church of Scotland Guild and encouraged gentlemen to become active members, and they are now taking active roles at local and national level. Today, over 130 years later, it has over 15,000 members and is one of Scotland's largest voluntary organisations. So what is it about? Well, here are some of the best bits. Having fun and fellowship. Energising our members from one end of the country to the other and everywhere in between. Raising money every three years for six projects at home and abroad. Bringing important issues like human trafficking and female genital mutilation to the heart of the church. Fostering positive relationships with Crossreach, World Mission, Faith and Older People, National Youth Assembly and other councils of the Church of Scotland. Nurturing faith in members and friends. Coming together to celebrate our friendship. Galvanising members to take action on local, national and international issues. Encouraging young and old to work together in the church and in the community. Developing relationships with the women and men schools of the Synod of Livingstonia in Malawi. Providing hospitality and welcome to new people and those on the margins of our communities. Growing grassroots initiatives through practical and financial support. Supporting the wider church to get involved with the Guild. And yes, the Guild does all of that and much more. What does a Guild mean to its members? It means 
friendship and fellowship, worship, prayer, singing, learning and outreach, love and faith. Togetherness, pastoral care, knowledge, confidence, laughter and joy, projects and fundraising, generosity and kindness, chatting and caring, being supportive and inclusive. It means serving by looking forward in faith and indeed going the extra mile. How do we do that? Well, many different ways as we go about our daily lives. One important part in which we play a role is within our project strategies. The Guild began supporting projects in 1969, raising funds for playgroups within churches and supporting many worthwhile causes, including drug addicts and prostitutes. Further development of the project scheme was started and all Guild's work was set out in three-year strategies. Our last three-year projects were supported during the period 2018 to 2021 and they have just completed a cycle. And I know our Guild members are really keen to know how much we raised. Over three years, the following money was raised. Crossreach received £98,665.39. The Sailor Society received £74,823.72. Boys Brigade Scotland received £90,778.11. The World Mission Council received £76,623.70. Malawi Fruits, £82,187.36. Free to Live Trust, £92,941.05. And for those mathematicians in the congregation, that totals up to £516.00. £516,019.05. Yes, we did go an extra mile even during a pandemic. And yes, we did indeed need to walk forward in faith. This now means we're entering a new three year period from 2021 to 2024. Our new strategy falls under the banner of Look Forward in Faith. And even if you're not a Guild member, that is something to hold on to. Since reading this at the very beginning when it was introduced, the number of times I have both said to myself and to others, look forward in faith. There's three new themes for each year. 21 to 22, the theme will be lights and bushels. 22 to 23, wee seeds and big trees. And 23 to 24, new wine and new wine skins. Now, there are six new projects and our guild will be working towards contributing to these projects. The first one is called BEAT, which is Blether with BEAT, and this is addressing issues around eating disorders. Home for Good is number two, finding homes for vulnerable children, working in awareness training and foster care. The third one I think we as guild members will probably like, it's called Pioneers, and it's called Chocolate Heaven. And this is supporting the farmers in the development of fair trade chocolate manufacturing. Star Child, finding the light in every child. Supporting children with additional needs and their families in Uganda. Unida, hear our voice. This is training women for ministry and service in Brazil. And the Vine Trust, it's Kasuna, which is a village of hope which has been built on the shores in Tanzania. The new projects will operate across four continents in a hugely diverse range of purposes. The Guild also helps with our church here in Blair Gowrie, our church boxes. And we need to express a huge thank you to Ken and Ethel for all their work over many years in helping to collate and collect and count. The church boxes go back to the pre-union days when there were two churches, Scotland churches in Blair Gowrie, 
St Mary's South, when there was a penny a day box, and St Andrew's Church had their guild boxes. And when the union of these two churches took place, they were combined to give the church boxes. This is an informal way of giving to the church. No record is made of who has boxes or how much is in them. The boxes are collected twice during the year, and the amount raised goes towards the work of the church and also to the work of the guild. We couldn't gather the boxes during the COVID pandemic, but a few weeks ago we were in a position to do so. The boxes were gathered and counted, and we are delighted to say the total of the box contents was over £1,000. The money will go towards the audiovisual equipment within our church, which we are very much in need of. Thank you to your collectors, the counters, and of course, members of our congregation who are the donors. If you'd like a box, you don't have one, please just let one of the guild leaders know. There's always been a very positive and innovative spirit about the Church of Scotland Guild, grounded in its motto, whose we are and whom we serve. This is now the time of a new beginning within our guild. And yes, it will mean change, but Change is about the acknowledgement of the present, anticipation of the future. It's not criticism of the past. Perhaps the most important thing we've seen during the pandemic is the impact of losing fellowship and personal contact. But now we offer new hope and encouragement to our members and friends. We are being called to let our light shine as we go the extra mile and look forward in faith. And the last and very most important question, how do you join the Guild? The Guild is open to anyone who accepts the aim. We meet tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock in the church hall and we are so looking forward to it. There'll be a lot of chat. All members, new members and friends will be made so welcome. This is a wonderful opportunity to put your faith into action. Well, thank you very much, uh, Margaret, for a very comprehensive update as to what the Guild have been doing and indeed what they do. It's definitely a very significant and very worthwhile achievement that they do. They are committed and indeed the Church of Scotland, uh, quite frankly, couldn't do without them. So we are delighted for all you do and our thoughts and prayers are with you and for you as you begin a new chapter in this uh, year ahead. Now before we hear the readings from uh, God's Word this morning, uh, we are going to turn once again to our hymn book. And our next hymn is 532, Lord, You Have Come uh, to the Seashore. To the seashore. Thank you.
Kathleen Webster if she will come and do an opening reading from Psalm 91. Thank you. Good morning. A psalm this morning in Psalm 19. God, our protector. Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, can say to him, You are my defender and protector. You are my God, and you I trust. He will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. You need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or the plagues that strike in the dark or the evils that kill in daylight. A thousand may fall dead beside you, ten thousand all around you, but you will not be harmed. You will look and see how the wicked are punished. You have made the Lord your defender, the most high your protector, and so no disaster will strike you. No violence will come near your home. God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. You will trample down lions and snakes, fierce lions and poisonous snakes. God says, I will save those who love me and will protect those who acknowledge me as Lord. When they call to me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honour them. I will reward them with long life. I will save them. Again, we are going to sing uh, our next hymn and it's 533, Will You Come? and follow me. She will come and do the other readings from God's Word this morning. Thank you. We have two readings from the New Testament this morning. The first is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But now I tell you, do not take revenge on someone who wrongs you. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, let him slap your left cheek too. 
And if someone takes you to court to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if one of the occupation troops forces you to carry his pack one mile, carry it two miles. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something, lend it to him. You have heard that it was said, love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may become the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike, and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The next reading is from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lesson of the Christian message. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God, of the teaching about baptisms and the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Let us go forward, and this is what we will do if God allows. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's light. They tasted heaven's gift and received their share of the Holy Spirit. They knew from experience that God's word is good and they had felt the powers of the coming age. And then they abandoned their faith. It is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing him to public shame. God blesses the soil which drinks in the rain that often falls on it and which grows plants that are useful to those for whom it is cultivated. But if it grows thorns and weeds, it is worth nothing. It is in danger of being cursed by God and will be destroyed by fire. But even if we speak like this, dear friends, we feel sure about you. We know that you have the better blessings that belong to your salvation. God is not unfair. He will not forget the work you did or the love you showed for him in the help you gave and are still giving to your fellow Christians. Our great desire is that each one of you keep up his eagerness to the end so that the things you hope for will come true. We do not want you to become lazy, but to be like those who believe and are patient and so receive what God has promised. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And before we hear uh, the message for this morning, we once again turn to our hymn books to sing our next hymn, uh, which is 237, uh, Look Forward in Faith.
Spirit. If you have your Bibles with you, can I invite you please to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. And these are the words from Jesus. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs you from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It was Mark Twain, the American writer, who once commenting about the Bible said, it's not those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that causes me trouble. Quite possibly, the passage before us this morning must have fitted into that category. For as we all know, Jesus, in his time with us here on earth, pronounced many hard and difficult sayings as they have been called. Quite frankly, he didn't preach what people wanted to hear. He pretty much said what they needed to hear. It wasn't easy at times, and certainly it was not often agreeable to those that listened to him. But nevertheless, he said what he had to say. Indeed, people very often had great difficulty in understanding some of those sayings from Jesus. For instance, to use a rather paraphrase language, he said, if someone comes up to you and slaps you on the cheek, instead of putting up your fist in retaliation, just turn your other cheek. Also, and if someone comes along and sues you to get your shirt, instead of defending yourself, just give him your coat also. And now here before us, he then said to them what must have been a rather offensive and unacceptable saying. If a Roman, again paraphrase, if a Roman soldier comes and says to you, carry my backpack for a mile, then said to him, yes, good, I'll be glad to carry it, not just one mile, but two miles for you. Certainly there wasn't room for pride in here, was there? Of course, ever since, the phrase going the second mile has found its way into our modern language. That is, whenever we think we have gone above and beyond the line of the call of duty, either with some individual or in some area of responsibility, we say, I went the second mile. It sounds rather noble and virtuous and even sacrificial. But going beyond the self-righteous attitude which this saying may generate and lead, the question surely must be, what does this teaching from Jesus really mean? Why did Jesus use uh, this image of the second mile? What lessons can we learn from it? And what is the Christian people to do about it? It was a rather noted uh, um, preacher of another generation 
the commenting on these words from Jesus said, the words spoken by Jesus Christ in his Sermon on the Mount contains enough power to change the course of the entire world. Now think for that for a few moments. There is no other source of power to transform as found both in Jesus' person and indeed in his message. These words of Jesus are part of the gift and they are said a wonder of the Christian life. This is what Christians are meant to be. This has nothing, may I say this with candidness please, and don't take this in the wrong way, but this is the truth from the teaching from this word. This, this has nothing to do with social gospel or political activism. This has nothing to do with that. And I know that there are some people who are involved in these sort of kinds of activities, but walking the second mile has nothing to do with it. But very much with Christian character, it has to do with Christian service. Now that is the second mile, if you like, of the Christian life. Now to properly understand the Jesus' words, we need to look at the historical context and the background of these words. We always has to, we have to do that in order for us to properly understand the teaching. What is the context of scripture when we read something such as this? Well, when Jesus said these words, Palestine had been occupied by Rome for about a hundred years by now. By this point, the Romans had conquered most of the Mediterranean world. And one of the marvels of their conquest was a vast system of superhighways that they had built for travel and for their conquerors' territories. They were more than 50,000 miles of these Roman roads throughout the empire. At each single mile was a stone marker, a road sign. These mile markers pointed to directions. It determines the distance to the next town as well as to Rome itself. And also it warned of dangers that might lie ahead. Hence the common phrase, all roads lead to Rome. The Romans had learned from the Persians to subjugate the people in order to use them to their advantage. And that is the Romans would often order Jewish civilians to carry his pack, or as it is known, the impedimenta. The impedimenta really, in a sense, is a kind of a military burden, as, and I, I would know that very well, having carried it for a long time, up to a hundred pounds at each given occasion. It, very heavy indeed. It carried clothing, footwear, eating utensils, his sleeping bag, and all sorts of personal items. By law, the civilian was legally required to carry the load for one mile. And the Jews, of course, hated it, as you can imagine. So every Jewish boy marked off one mile and then of course he would refuse to carry it beyond that point. And so to this context, in this context, Jesus told his followers that if they were commanded, in ordered to carry any kind of load for one mile, they ought to carry the load an extra mile. My friends, this is a statement of intent. This is the purpose. It is based on love and of grace. It is a command. It is not an optional extra. Whoever compels, uh, compels you to go one mile, go with them too. 
Now you can imagine the bombshell, can you? And the shock this must have been as it fell on the ears of those who basically listened to them. Heads must have turned when Jesus said those words. That was indeed an abomination to the average Jew, and especially the Pharisees. And here was a preacher, Jesus, commanding them to do something extra to assist the army of occupation. It just was not the thing they wanted to hear. But what is the teaching behind these words? There are two things I think we need to understand as Christian people here this morning. That this is a mandate. This mandate mile, the first mile or the second mile, is motivated by law. In other words, I think it is fair to say that all too often the first mile is ignored and overlooked. In fact, of all the years I have been a Christian, and that is quite a number of years now, I can remember the last time, if ever, hearing a sermon or reading an article about the first mile. I wonder whether you are maybe are going to prove me wrong here. Have you ever heard a sermon or read something that highlights the first mile? Normally it is always about the second mile. And yet when you think about it, the first mile is required for all of us. The first mile is always the hardest. Ask a distant runner, anyone who is into running, the second wind, as they call it, never kicks in on the first mile. It's always on the second or the third. Someone has said every race starts with the first step. Always. And that applies to our Christian service. And I know that the guild members would appreciate that very often the difficulty is not in the future, as it were, is actually at the very beginning. How do you start? How do you begin? And when you have started, how do you continue? The truth is, it is not easy to enjoy the things we have to do, as it is to enjoy the things that we want to do. The Christian life has its own commandments. We know them. We have our own mandates. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, and a host of teachings that Jesus gave us. And please note that when Jesus said the words of going the extra mile, he wasn't calling us to be complete pacifists. Not at all. The Bible is against anarchy and lawlessness. Instead, he is commanding us not to avenge not to retaliate, not to do any kind of vengeance or reprisals. As the Bible says in Romans and in the book of the Old Testament, do not avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, here it comes, the second mile. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you shall heap, heap coals of fire on his head. Therefore, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. My friends, you and I are not going to take personal revenge, but evil must be restrained, and the law is there to help us. And hear what Jesus is saying about the first mile and the second mile is very much to do that this is a mandate in which must be motivated by the law. That's why. We are told in the Bible, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man to the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king or governments, whether you approve or agree with them, because they have been appointed by the will and the sovereignty of God. 
what the Lord was trying to get the disciples and to us to understand is that however much you do, much more is required. You see, the Pharisees, as religious people can be sometimes, they were a minimalist. They would do the bare minimum. The bare minimum. That's why Jesus said to them that your righteousness has to supersede that of the Pharisees. In other words, the hellish level returns evil for good. The human level returns good for good. But God's way returns good for evil. The second mile mandated by the law. Let us all be law-abiding people. Let us do what needs to be done as Christians. Let us fulfill the law according to Scripture and show it through our character and through our good example. But this very briefly comes the second miracle of of these particular words of Jesus. For there is a miracle mile, as it were, motivated by love. It is this miracle mile that separates certain individuals from others. The second mile only made possible by being obedient to the first mile. The second mile has a way of brightening and cheering up our own road. But it is more than that. It will actually change us altogether. Because when we know we are doing the will of God, does that make you happy? Does that bring a sense of joy to know that you are doing the will of God? Of course it does. It will change your attitude. You are required to go the first mile. And yes, you may hate every step of it. But the second mile, Christ's mile, you are going to do it out of love. It is the first mile you are the victim, but the second mile you will be the victim. In the first mile you are going to be controlled by duty, but the second mile you are going to be controlled by love and the grace of Christ. The first mile is the law, but the second is the love of God. The first mile can make you bitter, but the second mile gives you joy and peace within. The second mile completely changes your attitude. You go from drudgery to victory. Your attitude changes from conquered to conquering. Now I know, and I speak to the guild here, the guild and all their individual members have always, I believe, understood the concept of the extra mile. Not many of you have carried a heavy rucksack of a hundred pounds. But I don't know, maybe you have. I would like to think not. Maybe you haven't done that, but I, am, I know that members of the guild, indeed of branches and the guild together or the National Council, have been asked to do something, it is very rare, then you do not exceed expectations. You have always done that and probably more. And that is why, in a sense, here in this passage, this is not an instruction, but rather it is an encouragement. Whatever you do for Christ, do for each other. That's what it says in here. Don't just do the bare minimum, like a religious person that basically does what needs to be done no more. Go the extra mile. Go a little bit further. Remember whose you are and whom you serve. Think about it. One cannot travel a second mile without influencing others. It only takes one second mile in a home to change the entire atmosphere of an environment. It only takes one second mile on a team or in an office, in a church, to do the same. It only takes one individual to commit himself or herself to go the second mile of love, to make a huge difference to anyone's life. 
And my friends, I speak to myself as I know I'm speaking to you. Going the second mile should not be a drudgery. It should not be a burden. It should actually be a joy. Something that we want to do. It was George Muller, who was a wonderful servant of Christ in Bristol. He came from Germany initially, but he went to Bristol to start orphanages for children who were orphaned. And on one occasion, he obviously he had to come to terms with the call that God had given him. And this is what he said, and I quote, There was a day when I died, utterly died to George Muller and his opinions, his preferences, his taste, and his will. I die to the world, its approval and its censure. I die to the approval or blame of even my brethren and friends. And since then, I have learned I only to show myself approved unto God. This must always be our motivation. Pleasing God. Let me just, as I bring my reflection this morning to a close. This, I believe, is the Spirit of Christ. Remember what Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Do you think that Jesus walked the extra mile here? I think we all know the answer to that, isn't it? I'm going to finish with a story which is a true story and one which I am sure will resonate to guild members, but I hope to all of us here this morning. Jane Haney was born in Dunsko near Dumfries in 1897. And in 1932, she became matron of the Scottish Jewish Mission School in Budapest where she cared for around 400 children aged between 6 and 16, 50 of whom were orphans and the majority of whom were Jewish. She lavished care and love on the children, letting them know of Jesus' love for all of them. She was on holiday in Cornwall when war was declared and immediately returned to Budapest to be with the girls. And in 1940, Jane was ordered by the Church of Scotland's World Mission Council to return home, but she refused. The second mile here comes in. She again refused to leave Budapest in 1944 after the Nazi invasion of Hungary. The reason? If these children need me in days of sunshine, she said, how much more do they need me in days of darkness? She was arrested by the Gestapo in April 1944. Accused of working with Jews and listening to the BBC, she was taken to Auschwitz. She died in the gas chamber three months later. Jane is the only Scottish person to have been honored at the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as being one of the righteous among nations. And she was also honored in April 2019 in Hungary during a torchlight march of the living procession as the research shows that she saved many other Jews from certain death by helping them emigrate to Britain. Now this, I believe, undoubtedly is the true story of an inspirational woman who certainly went the extra mile. Of course, many of us will not think, I can never aspire to do that. And maybe that is true. But many of us do go the extra mile looking after friends and loved ones through illness and difficult times, walking, supporting, and continuing to walk with those who need company, for those who need our care and support, our efforts and prayers and energy, 
And you do that very often as fund, as skill members by fundraising to support those in, our pro, in your projects whose situations are so different from ours. And so let me say, in the words of Jesus, whoever shall compel you to go one mile, go with them two miles. This, I believe, is the way of Jesus Christ. It is his way. It is God's way. May he help us to do the, our part and resolve to walk with him. Our Father, we want to give you thanks for your word. And we pray, dear Lord, that as we endeavor to do what you want us to do, Help us to walk the extra mile, not reluctantly, but help us, dear Lord, to do so with a sense of joy and love for the sake of the gospel and for the blessing of those that need our support and our care. Help us to be people both not only of the mile of the law, but also, Father, of the mile which is motivated by love. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And so we, I, I'm going to ask the members of the guild if they will stand at this point. O oh Lord, our God, we dedicate ourselves to save you faithfully, to love you with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and to love one another as your Son, Jesus Christ, has shown his love for us. Renew us, refresh us, as we continue on our journey through life. Be with us as the girl constantly faces challenges which lie ahead. Support us as we decide which of the old ways we should preserve and which new things we should embrace. Guide our thinking so that tradition is not preserved for its own sake, nor change introduced just because it is different. May they be used wisely to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Amen. And so please be seated. I'm going to ask Margaret if she will come and say the prayers. Thank you. Gracious and loving Father. We are all surrounded by your love, and today we thank you for the depth of that love which helps us to know you and be known more deeply by you. We know you have promised to be with us wherever we are and whatever we are doing. Help us to recognise you in our comings and goings, day by day. Guide us so that we may step forward and look forward in faith. Go beyond us and beside us. Turn left and turn right. Let your light shine in us and through us, and may we find you in everything we do and everyone we meet. Loving Lord, as well as for the good of each one of your children, who feeds us and forgives us, guides and protects us, we pray for our neighbours. For those in poor health, we ask for your healing and comfort. For the hungry, we ask for provision and sharing. For those who hurt others, we ask for change of heart to gentleness. Loving Father, forgive us for the ways in which we walk by on the other side when we avoid the bereaved, the depressed, the chronically ill. Be with them, Father. Surround them with your love and comfort. Forgive us too, Father, we are joy of richness of food and comforts without thought of who has paid and how. When through lack of knowledge, time and sensitivity, we cause hurt to others. Inspire us to see and to seek those with whom we may share your love in word, money, action and prayer. Help us, Lord, to walk that extra mile in your name. We pray for all who bring your word of life as a light to those in darkness, for those who bring your word of peace to those enslaved by fear, and for those who bring your love to those in need of comfort. 
We pray for those who do not live in freedom, enslaved and imprisoned by the abuse of their human rights, for those enduring human trafficking and modern-day slavery, those suffering from addictions, for those experiencing domestic abuse and violence, and for those in financial difficulties. Help us, Lord, to reflect more deeply on the injustices of this world, which creates division and impedes your mission. And through your love, may we reach out to those in need. Help us not to forget that you are with us in every time of perplexity, to guide and to direct, in every time of sorrow, to comfort and console, in every time of temptation, to strengthen and inspire, in every time of loneliness, to cheer and to befriend. As we seek to walk the extra mile in your name, may your light shine within us and around us. Grant us wisdom, Lord, to know what we must do. Grant us the will to want to do it, the courage to undertake it, the perseverance to continue, and the strength to complete it. You turn darkness into light, and we pray that your light will shine throughout the world and enable all to live in freedom and peace. Let us not forget, Lord, whose we are and whom we serve. We thank you this morning, Lord, for those sitting beside us, for all that unites us, for the friendship that grows among us. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for the love that you pour out on us. May we share that love in all we do, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we come uh, to the end of our service and we sing our final hymn, 710, I Have a Dream.
Now there is the guild prayer, and again, if I can invite the members of the guild uh, to repeat. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me right where I am. Help me to know your love deep in my heart and enable that love to flow from me to those with whom I am in contact. Amen. Let us go forth into the world in peace and dedicated to God's service. Let us hold fast to that which is good, render to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and honour all people. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of His Spirit and walking the extra mile together. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.